Amen. So last week, JP shared the word. If you weren't here, please go and uh, have a look. Um, and the week before that, was it two? Yeah, it was two. Two is there at the back. I saw him there somewhere too. He really preached a very practical sermon on making small investments. And it wasn't about uh, things with monetary value only. It was really in talking about spiritual things and spiritual investments, taking small te- steps, but remaining faithful in that. And over the span of your life, just continue to doing, take small steps, the right steps, keep on growing in faith, continue to serve. Um, JP, the one I think you didn't mention this morning was prayer. We really want to encourage you and, and uh, we, we really want to encourage you to come and pray with us. Eight o'clock on a Sunday morning again, we want to uh, yeah, encourage you to. And I want to thank you for those who, who did join this morning where we pray for the service, where we intercede for various things. Um, we really believe that it's important, so please join us. And then, um, servant at the back. Lady at the back, if you go to the, um, to the first slide, um, that's the slide that J- JP shared last week. Um, I'm not going to talk all of that. I think JP will next week, when he continues, he will share. But Jesus is on the, in the center, as always. Jesus needs to be there. Um, those themes, we, we made, it's basically the mega themes of the book of Acts. In, uh, in many ways, it's part of the core of the gospel, the expansion of the church. I shared on, on the book of Acts last year, early on in this year, in a sense, it's about witnessing the church, the growth of the church, growing opposition and the Holy Spirit. And as we continue in the next few weeks, we want to zoom into those, those themes. As I said, it's kind of mega themes of the book of Acts, like a bit of an umbrella, important building blocks, foundational things for us as God's church. So this morning... I want to I want to I want to continue in that sense and and uh, talk about faithful steps and believing hearts. Now uh, before we take our first faithful steps in God's kingdom, you know, we need believing hearts. We need hearts and I'll, 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 I just reflected over the weekend again as I prepared about my first steps in God's kingdom. And maybe if you are here, well, you are here this morning, but to think and to reflect on whether it was a year or five ago, maybe 10 or 20 or 30, 40 years ago, when you take your first steps, when you take those, those first precious steps as a new young believer, probably unsure about things in God's kingdom and the word, many things were probably new to you, but you know, it's so important that we continue with our faithful steps. And it's something that we prayed for, something that we interceded for. The enemy usually comes, and he always comes to discourage us, and he he wants us to become passive and and all of those things. And I'm on the prison ministry intercession group, and it's just beautiful to see uh, Daryl and Hannah Lure respectfully said in your older age, how you continue with your faithful steps, being God's servants and ministering there. It's really powerful. Now, when we turn to Scripture and we talk about believing hearts, because that's where it, it's, we don't just want to do works. We need faith. We need works. And I started on early on in the year with our Shofar statement of faith, where I said that 15 of the 17 points on our statement of faith talks about what we believe. It says, we believe. And I hope that some of you went back and uh, had a look on what we believe JP, I didn't get any calls or anyone that said, I don't agree, so hopefully you all are in agreement and that we will continue with what we believe. It's it's foundational. So, uh, but when we look um, to Scripture, I think one of the most foundational, important places in the Old Testament, early on in the Bible, we find in Genesis chapter 15, there's a man with the name called Abram, and I'm not going to, but he is quoted quite often in the New Testament, so therefore we know what happened way back in the Old Testament was significant. Now, I just want to read you, and it's a beautiful story, and I want to encourage you to go and read everything about Abram. Um, then in Genesis chapter 15, uh, the covenant, God's covenant with Abram, it's one of the covenants in the Old Testament. Um, But you can read with me from Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 to 6 this morning. And it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? 
For I continue childless, and the heir of my house, Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and the member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, your, your erfgenaam. Your very own son shall be your first heir, your, your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall, be, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, I, I, I love the story, you know, Abraham, older man, he wants a son, he wants offspring, he wants something to, to in, someone to inherit from him. And here, Abraham and God, in a sense, is, is having a conversation. God came to him in a vision. And here in verse 6, we see a beautiful place. Um, and the Lord said, or scripture says, and he believed the Lord. And isn't that a word for all of us? So often we doubt. We are like Thomas. We want to say, but Lord, is your word real? Is scripture real? Is the gift here real? Is heaven real? Is this real? Is that real? And it's a beautiful example, a foundational one that's quoted four times in the New Testament, uh, uh, Genesis 15 verse 6. And it says, and he believed the Lord. And I believe Hopefully it can be something early on in this new year where many of us will say, and Daryl believed the Lord, and JP believed the Lord, and Aninka believed the Lord, and, and Carl believed the Lord, because the enemy, he wants to come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to kill us in every possible way, but especially in this area of faith, especially in this area of faith, he would love a church that doesn't have faith. Okay, a church with faith is a, is a powerful faith. So he would do anything to discourage and dismantle our faith. And uh, I just want to briefly read it, verse 6 to you from the New King James Version. It will be up there. I, uh, I, I, I like the, the way it's written with capital letters. In verse 6 it says, And he believed in the Lord. If you go there uh, the, at, the, at the top, you will see. I just want to read it to you. And it says, And he believed in the Lord. Now that is Abram. And it says, and he with a capital letter, that is God, accounted it to him for righteousness. So I think it's a bit more appropriate with the capital letter in a sense. I just want to briefly also read to you from the Amplified Bible. Amplified Bible always helps us a little bit understanding and gives us a, some context. Many of us are English is our second, second language, so it gives us, it fills it in a little bit. Um, the Amplified Bible says, Then Abraham believed in, affirmed, trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord, and he, which is God, he counted, credited it to him as righteousness, doing right in regard to God and man. And then lastly, just the New Living Translation, an easy flowing um, uh, translation, it says, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord, counted, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, a while ago when I preached, I also referred to Hebrews chapter 11, and it says, in faith. You know, often it refers to the men and the women of faith, everything they did in faith. And I... Yeah, there's so many things that I, I mean, where can we stand? The things that we don't understand about God. But one thing I know is that we are always encouraged to pray and that we pray in faith. And uh, I've uh, planted there on a little piece of land a few pumpkins and mealies and a few tomatoes and butternut and a few things. And I said, for the last little, uh, while, early at, at the end of January, our family, we did our faith goals and different things where we trust God for. I said, God, I trust you for rain specifically. And, uh, but I trust in a specific way, specific amount of millimeters with one rain, rain bay, more than this. And it seems that God really answered that prayer. Now, the part that I do not understand is how all the things work in the heavenlies. When and how and how God um, gives us rain or the things that we ask for. If you have been walking with God for a long time, then you will know that 
faith goal sometimes at the end of Jan January 2024 becomes the faith goals at the end of January 2025, 2026, 2027, and then maybe 5 or 10 or 20 years later, God brings the breakthrough. And I believe in a similar manner with Abraham, he was trusting for a long time, probably crying out to God, and here God says, so shall your offspring be, I will give it to you. And uh, it seemed very impossible. We saw Sarah even laughing about it in a sense. How can a woman at the old age bear a child? But it says, and ye believe God. This is a key verse in Genesis, quoted four times. It will be up there on the screen. You can go and read it. The reference in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Paul quotes it. Also in Romans chapter 4, verse 22. In Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 6. And in James chapter 2, verse 23, we see there's a reference to specifically uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So uh, the men of God, James and Paul, Early leaders in the early church, they quote this very significant scripture. Please go and do a study in your own time if you want to. But we know that faith in God is something that everyone in the Bible was ex uh, ex expected to exercise. And nothing has changed. You know, whatever we do, whatever we trust for during this year as families, as, as husbands and wives, maybe as small groups or ministries or, or whichever the way, or corporately as a church, JP made the announcement just now, um, we will have our biannual uh, pro global prayer and fast where there's always things where we as a church family says, Lord, we stand in faith. Lord, we want to trust you for specific things. We want to put our faith together and say, Lord, we want to trust you. The Lord uses us as his people to pray for specific things. So early on in the year when we talk about faith and faithful steps, uh, we know it starts with believing hearts. Hearts like an Abraham where we can say, Lord, we believe. And we know that so many things in the media, so many things on social media these days uh, are specifically aimed and designed to attack our faith, to discredit the church or Jesus or the word of God. Um, I'm sure that you're aware of that. Um, and that's what we need to fight. Um, Paul says we need to stand against the, the attacks of the enemy, etc., and we know that when we, when we believe, it's, there's a reference to our trust in or our confidence or our reliance on God. So, but we know it wasn't just something for there way back in Genesis chapter 15 for Abraham. We know it's, it's, a, it's a theme in the New Testament as well. And I just want to briefly, uh, in John, the gospel according to John, we also see the aspect of faith and uh, believe, believing hearts, what we are talking about. And uh, they will be at the end, I felt, and I, me and JP discussed it early on. Um, it's something that we feel that if, the, if, that's, if it's an area in your life where you feel that your shoulders are hanging and maybe you are just discouraged and you probably at some time were a man or a woman of faith and you battle with that. Church is real. It happens to all of us from time to time maybe. Um, that we want to pray for people that, that maybe battle with that. But here in John chapter 1, verse 12 to 20, um, uh, John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, John wrote the beloved disciple and he says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. It's a similar golden line or thread that we can pull through from Abraham. We see John writing here, he says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There's something about the new birth and being spirit-filled when we believe in the name of God. Now, that is not just identifying with Christianity. It's not just identifying with the church or identifying with Jesus Christ, but really believing in everything. When we say we believe in the name of Jesus, we believe in everything that is true. What Scripture says about Jesus Christ, that every knee will bow and that every tongue will confess. And there's an abundance of Scripture that, that speaks about the person of Christ, his death, his resurrection, and all of that. 
And uh, as I said, once again, on a side note, go and read our show for Statement of Faith. It's, it's not a, um, it's, it's everything is derived from the Word of God, and it speaks about what we believe. So when we talk about faith, when we talk about believing, when we talk about the book of Acts, when we talk about the mega themes and all of that, um, and, and, and go and read the story about Abraham, as I said. But you know, what was your first faithful steps after a believing heart were, were established or cultivated? So when you came to Christ, whether it was a year ago or a few decades ago, you know, I remember, and I, I made a few bullets, you know, when the Lord Jesus saved me way back in 2002, you know, there was belief where I said, Lord, I believe in your name. I don't understand everything, but I believe. And after belief, faithful steps is the, next, is the, is the way forward. And as I said, I think, I think there's a place where the enemy has, as sometimes in Afrikaans, he sometimes got to us uh, for, through various uh, things that he wants to discourage us. But I remember I went to a new church. I went to join a small group for the first time. That encounter one and encounter three that JB spoke about, way back it was called the foundation one and foundation two and foundation three and foundation four. I went and I went to study or went to uh, take part in that and I grew a lot. I, I learned new things. I joined the small group. I, I went to uh, do Bible school and in a, in a sense, we know that our nation, Namibia, when we receive rain, we are like a sponge. Our nation, our, not our nation, our land can receive, can, can absorb like a sponge a lot of, a lot of rain. But in the same way, a new, a, a new believer is, you know, you are like a sponge and there's a lot of information, a lot of growing, a lot of new things that we want to absorb. So, uh, um, I went home and I shared with my father what happened in my life and what I experienced. And there was a bit of a question mark because he didn't understood everything. But what I do believe, there was fruits of repentance. There was fruits of salvation. There was fruits of something that happened in my life and the change around in the course that I, that I took. Even my friends uh, slowly, slowly but surely uh, did change a little bit because I had to realign and calibrate a few things in my life. And uh, what did your life look like? What did your first steps look like a year or five or 20 or 30 um, ago? Maybe you are here this morning and maybe your heart is beating a bit faster. Maybe, maybe you are at the crossroad in your life where you need to take some of those first steps and be like an Abram. And maybe even today is the day where you need to say, Lord, but I want to believe. Lord, you are stirring something in my life, and I want to believe, and I want to, I want to early on in this new year, I want to take faithful steps once again. I spoke to JP also last week, and we, spoke, we speak a lot. That's what pastors do. We speak, and we drink coffee, and we read Bible. So if you're not... If you, know, if you don't believe us, come and join us and you'll see. But nevertheless, um, I say to him, but who God is in your life will determine a lot regarding the steps that you will take. When I read this Psalm 145, every word that is, that is written here speaks of a person that's got the intimate relationship with God who is in awe of God, who writes this psalm that we can read out in early in February and say, God, you are great. God, I'm thankful. God, you are wondrous from the stars and everything that we can perceive about what you have created around us. Who is God or Jesus in your life early on in this year? If you serve a small God, you know, then that steps will probably be very small. If, if you serve the God who created the heavens and the earth, who saved you from death and brought you from darkness into the kingdom of light, that steps will be big because we are in awe of God and what he did in our lives. Is your tank full of faith? Is your tank maybe running a bit low or empty? 
And in the past 22 years of serving the Lord, there were times when I really um, went into a fast or pray with a lot of faith. And there's been times or weeks when I just had to took one step after the other because my tank was probably a bit empty for, for whatever reason. But that's why God places us in a church family. We place us in a, in a place where a brother or a sister can yoke with us, carry us. Last week, Thursday, elders with the advisory board, we had a meeting and, and we talked about this whole concept of, of uh, believing hearts and faithful steps. And I think one of the conclusions we came to is in John chapter 15. And, 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 and you probably know it quite well. And I just very, very, very briefly want to read John chapter 15 from verse 4. And I think there's, there's many scriptures that encourage us or show us how to be planted and to be rooted. But here in John chapter 15 verse 4, just briefly want to read it. It says when we talk about being faithful and being, having believing hearts and taking the right steps and bearing fruit inside God's kingdom. It says there, and I'm reading from the New King James Bible. It's not on the screen. Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And church, that's a promise. It's a given. We cannot change it. Okay? It's a place where the Word of God teaches us and says we need to be in Christ. Okay? And then we will bear fruit. So without making a sermon out of it, John chapter 15, I believe it's, a, it's like a bullseye of a dartboard. It teaches us something very important about abiding in Him, walking with Him. Um, yeah, how can I say? Just uh, walking with the Lord and uh, having a faithful, uh, having a believing heart and taking some faithful steps. I want to use two examples. And I'll, I'll, I know it's hot. Is it hot in here? A little bit hot. Some say yes, some say no. So I know I, I can see all things here from the front. People, your, oh, it's very interesting people's body language. I actually love body language. So you are watching me, but I'm watching you as well. Okay. So body language says a lot. So if you are oh, going like that, I know I need to end off or talk a little bit faster or uh, any something like that. Two important examples for us from the word because that's where we gain our focus, our strength, and our vision. I read in the past week and now with my Tuesday discipleship group, I can see Ananias is here. I just have to find, I know Luan is here and a few of the guys. Um, we had a look at John chapter 4. Now, I'm a lot in John this morning, but I'm not going to read the whole story of the Samaritan woman. You all know that story, more or less. Some say, ooh, you know, yes, but, yeah, JP says yes, he has read it. Now, I'm not going to read all of that. It's, a, it's a quite a long chapter, but it's basically Jesus is a Jew, the Samaritan you, uh, uh, woman. She came to draw water from the well. It's a bit awkward, awkward moment because she's, a, she's female and he's male and she's Samaritan and he's a Jew. And they are not always on a good standing. A lot of history uh, where you can go and read a little bit about that. And he asked for water. Uh, 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 you know, I must just get my story right that I don't lie to you. I know some of you listen very well. Um, but... Uh, it basically, he asks her, yeah, it's about living water and being thirsty and all of that. Please go and read it. I don't want to uh, paraphrase or, or, or lie to you this morning. But basically, after a bit of a conversation, Jesus cuts to the point. And that's the condition of our heart, where her life is at. And he says to her, listen, uh, go and fetch your husband. And she says, uh, maybe I can read that, uh, that small portion to you. He says to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you have spoken truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then the conversation continues 
Um, and Jesus basically holds a mirror in front of her and says, your life isn't in good standing. Your life isn't right. There's certain things that's wrong. You're probably living in sin. And, and he's very, very direct and very in your face. I think a lot of us in this day and age will be tremendously offended when, uh, when Jesus speaks to us like that because we live in a seeker-sensitive culture, which is obviously wrong in many ways. Jesus was very upfront, but his heart he had the ultimate love, the ultimate compassion, and he wanted to restore this woman. And they had this conversation, and, uh, and basically, I'm going to continue from, from verse 20, uh, 27, and it says, And at that point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked to a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left um, left the water pot, went away into the city, and said to the men, Come, see, a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. And then it continues from verse 32 to 38. Please go and read that at home. But I want to really get to verse 39 quickly, and I want to read that to you. John chapter 4, verse 39. So Jesus and this woman had this encounter. He is the Christ, the anointed one, Jesus Christ, the anointed one. He knows everything about the life. He speaks into a life. But listen, this, the way I read it, this probably broken woman with living in sin, having some issues. But listen how God uses her. I believe there's something about a believing heart and there's something about faithful steps. Although she is as young as you can get, listen to what Scripture says in verse 39. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the, the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. Verse 42. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you say that we believe. You know, that sentence, I've used it quite often. That we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this uh, is indeed the savior of the world. Okay, so it says many Samaritans. How many is many? I don't know. It doesn't say. It says many, 10, 20, 50, I don't know. But it means that quite a lot, many Samaritans from that specific town believed in him. After this conversation, Jesus and the woman at the well, it's she, she went home or went to the village and she speaks to the people and scripture says, and many believed in him, just as Abram. And then that word that I always emphasize, put it in yellow, it says, because. Because what? Because what happened? It says, because of the woman's testimony. Okay, church, and there's something, a step that we can take. Whether you are very young in the kingdom of God, whether you've been there for generations or decades, even in that sense, this woman went back. She was still that morning probably living in sin, but she went back to the village, and Scripture says many Samaritans from that village believed in him, in Jesus Christ, because of what? The woman's testimony. She didn't keep quiet. She went and she testified. Now, if you really, really, really know me, now I tell you, you probably know me the best after 20 years or what from, then JP and then some of our friends here. But if you know how difficult it is for me to stand in front of a group of people, it's not what I wanted to do. I give you my word. At school, I was one of the guys standing, shaking. I couldn't speak English. I, I really didn't aspire. Now, after 15 years, it goes a little bit easier standing in front of people preaching the gospel. But I want to encourage you with all my heart that if you... I don't want to say if you are like a Samaritan woman, but you, because you might hear something I'm not saying. But if you are here this morning, go to your village, go to your clan, go to your group of people, and be like this woman and testify, you know, that some might be saved because of your testimony. 
If you think I'm not an Angus Buchan or a Billy Graham or someone like that with, that can fill stadiums, it's a lie from the enemy. Each and every one of us with a believing heart can take faithful steps to testify. And guess what? Was it that woman? It, it's because of her testimony that many believed, but she didn't save them. It's the Lord Jesus. It was God. I, wrote a, I read a quote from a Darrell, our John Piper. Me and Darrell had John Piper conversations over the years. And he says, just to summarize, it's the only sentence I'm using from his um, commentary on this passage. And he says, that's the amazing upshot of Jesus' trip to Samaria. A surprising spiritual awakening in the town of Sychar. An unlikely woman becomes the means of an unlikely people turning to the Jewish Messiah. Okay? And we can be that unlikely person. We just need to say, Lord, I'm willing to take a faithful step. So just quickly, it says many Samaritans from that town came to Christ. Many believed. Then they invited Jesus and say, stay with us two more days. What this little mustard seed of this woman, okay? She went and it says many believed, okay? Then they invited Jesus. He stayed for two days longer. What happened next? Verse 41 says, and many more believed. We're a charismatic church. Someone should say amen, okay? Because whenever someone is transferred from the kingdom of darkness to light, from death to life, we should, we should say amen. We should say hallelujah. We should say God is good. His mercies are amazing, okay? And this is what happened. And you know what? They actually came to a deeper revelation of Jesus, because listen in verse 42, this woman had very, very basic knowledge of Jesus Christ when she went home, but that mustard seed, God used it. Verse 42, it's, it says, they say to the woman, now this is, this is the many more who, who, who believe, eh? they say to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, they believed, for we have heard for ourselves. That's the portion I want to underline. It's underlined in my notes, but not on there. For we have believed for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Isn't it beautiful? Encounter at the well, women go back to the town. Many believed, many more believed. And they came to a deeper revelation. It's not just through this woman's testimony anymore. It's now because they have spent time with Jesus Christ. And they said, now we have heard for ourselves with our own ears. Now we have understanding. An unlikely woman in an unlikely town. And God says, I'm going to use you. It's good enough. It's almost coffee time, church. I'm ending off. The last example that I want to encourage us with this morning. Um, and I do believe, and I'm putting it out there to test it, so you are welcome to, to let me know if you agree or not agree. But I believe it's a word on restoration for us. And God always, there will be in a group of 100 people, He wants to do corporate restoration or restoration individually. And the example that I also spoke of during the week is Peter. Peter is a colorful um, person in the New Testament, a bold guy. He's the guy that takes the few, first few steps and walks on water. He's the guy that cuts off the soldier's ear. And uh, he's also the guy that fails terribly, terribly, when he should be a friend to Jesus in a sense. Let me briefly read to you you probably are familiar with that story, but there's a message in the Samaritan woman and in Peter's life for all of us, I believe. John chapter 13, it's a similar passage in John chapter 13 and in Matthew 26, wording is a little bit different, so please read with me. I, I believe it's up there as well. John chapter 13, verse 36 to 38, New Living Translation. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready to die for you. 
Jesus answered, Die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny you will deny three times that you even know me. Peter says, I'm the guy, I'm the man, I'll walk with you, I will not disappoint you, Lord, I am willing to die with me. And Jesus says, Peter, you're going to fail. You're even going to deny that you know me. Now, the rest is history, but the same passage in Matthew 26, uh, yeah, Matthew 26, verse 30 to 35, it says, then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Olives, Verse 31. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me. For scripture says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be, sheep, will be scattered. Now Jesus is quoting Zechariah 13 verse 7 there. Um, and he says, God will strike the shepherd with a capital letter and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if, even if everyone else deserts you, Lord, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crow, crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Verse 35, no, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you with exclamation mark. And all the disciples vowed the same. Church, what would your commentary be if you have to write a commentary on that? What do we say? Um, I don't want to, some churches call him Saint Peter. Um, I don't want to say to, I don't want to point a finger at Peter. But you know, in our culture, we will probably say, oh, weakling, why could you do that? How, Peter, how could you do this? Um, you can write your own commentary at that point of time on what Peter actually did. But you know what? Peter failed there. Peter, Peter failed. He made a promise, said, Lord, I'll die for you. And then, as you know, around the fire with the soldiers and with the slave girl, it seemed that Peter said, hey, this Jesus guy, I never saw him, I never met him, I'm not one of them, and he just wanted to save his own bacon, in a sense. But the part that really matters, the story doesn't end there. We see in John chapter 21, and please go and read the commentary, uh, the, the whole chapter at, um, at home, I'm not going to read it now. But we see that, that Jesus go and he says, Peter, 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 do you love me? And then he actually goes and he says, Peter, feed my sheep. Let me read it to you three times. He says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. Peter, feed my sheep. And the Lord restores Peter and he recommissions Peter. That same Peter that broke his promise, who said, I will not do this, and he did the opposite, who failed terribly. But God recommissioned him. Jesus recommissioned him. And in the book of Acts, in the early church, for at least the first 15 chapters, we see a bold Peter following the Lord Jesus Christ, keeping his eyes fixed on him. No matter beatings or stonings or all the things that happened to him, being put in jail and all of that, Peter standing up boldly, preaching the gospel, being the, one of the leaders in the early church, one of the apostles. And I believe the moral of the story this morning, believing hearts, it starts with believing hearts and then faithful steps. I spoke about the Samaritan woman. Maybe, maybe you might relate to her in some way or the other. Maybe I can, but God still wants to use you in his kingdom. I promise you that. Maybe there was a similar type of a Peter moment somewhere in your life where you said, Lord, I will never sin again. Lord, I will never say it again. I will never do it again. I will never think it again. And I'm not going to ask you to show hands. I'll probably have to show all my hands because I failed. Daryl, you said something so beautiful last year when you said, those that were caught in jail, you just haven't been caught. I know, don't know the detail, but we are all like that. Who of us didn't miss the mark? Who of us can point a finger? Who of us have not failed since we said yes to Jesus Christ? Who of us can say we are without sin? 
None of us, because then we can be self-righteous and we can go to heaven and say, God, here I am, accept me. But we need Jesus to, to be the high priest, to be the intercessor in our lives. And this is the God that we serve, church, that will use that Samaritan woman that many and many more will come into the kingdom of God. It's the God that says, Peter, I'm not going to cut you off. I'm not going to chase you away. Although you broke your word, although that you lied, and as I said, use your own commentary. Peter, I will recommission you, and you will become a strong leader in the church. If you are here this morning and maybe.